for hail, you need to have the updraft because it actually bats it back into the cloud, doesn't it? Okay, and so as it starts to come down, it's batted back into the cloud and over and over again, and that's how you can get bigger and bigger pieces of hail. And so that's that picture of the hail formation. And then, oh, and there you go. And, and that's why the, the hail can look so funny because it's actually getting pieces reattached to as it goes back into the cloud and it's batted back and forth into the cloud. Then we have snow. And snow actually is, is a Bergeron process, we believe and it comes out and um, as long as it's cold, it comes out as hail. Now remember, there were other things like if, the, if it comes down as rain and the the, uh, everything on the surface is really, really cold and it freezes when it hits the ground, then we call it freezing rain. If it comes down as raindrops and it passes through some cold air on its way down and turns into little pellets of ice, then what do we call it? Sleet. Sleet. Okay, so you're supposed to know all those. Um, and if it just comes down in the pretty little doilies, we call it snow. And there's your snow. And there's just some pictures of snow. I showed you this last time. That would be what? What would that be? Sleet. It's okay, because we come from down here, and I'm with you. It's hard to remember. Freezing rain looks like ice. It comes down as rain, and then when it hits, it freezes. So it's just going to look like an, and that's what we call an ice storm. That's actually freezing rain. So it's rain, and when it hits, it freezes. Isn't that weird? But that's what it is, okay? Um, and that's because th this helped me, because I'm thinking as a South Floridian going, how does that work? Okay, well, this is how it would work. If it's regular, you know, it's, it's warm here, the rain comes down, but look at the, the, remember the warm front pushes over the top of the cold front as it's pushing it out. So as the warm front is up here and the water's coming down, it's coming as rain, but when it hits down here, it's still under the, uh, the cold air and it freezes. That's how it happens. Otherwise, I'm looking at it going, what? Uh, and then the raindrops actually turn into rain here, but it's still cold under here, so they refreeze as sleet. And then if they can just come down cold, they come down as snow. That helped me because, like I said, I looked at it and went, how do you get that? So that's how. And that's what freezing rain looks like. And we call that an ice storm. But that's what it looks like. And it just destroys the power lines and the trees. And it's very, very destructive. And then people get very, very cold. Anyway, OK, what do we call that when it's on the, the grass? OK, when it's not frozen, it's dew. And when it's frozen, it's frost. Very good. And remember, and you're going to need to know it on your test, there are two things that affect the dew point. The dew point is the temperature that frost, excuse me, that dew sets or that the water condenses on things. And it depends on pressure and humidity. And it says the higher the pressure and humidity, the higher the dew point. Isn't that nice that they're both higher? So the higher the pressure and humidity, the higher the dew point. Okay, so the lower in pressure and humidity, the lower the dew point. Okay, and then we learned about thunderstorms. And we learned that thunderstorm cells only last about an hour, um, that there's three stages to a thunderstorm. There's the updraft stage, and that is the cumulus stage. Then there's the up and downdraft part. That is the mature stage. And then when it's all downdraft, we said that that was the di dissipation stage, the up draft was where the hot air rises and it carries a bunch of the uh, water, evaporated water and stuff with it. When you've got an updraft and a downdraft, that's the most dangerous part of a thunderstorm because it's still being fed, but it's also sending the, the downdrafts and they can be very, very dangerous depending on how strong they are. And then when it's all in the dissipation stage and it's all downdrafted, it, it tends to not be as dangerous anymore. Okay. And so, and then we said that that's showing you an anvil thundercloud, okay, because it levels off when it gets to the stratosphere, the bottom of the stratosphere. Um, there's your development stage or the cumulus stage. Here you have your mature because you got the updraft and the downdraft, and then when it's all downdraft, it's called the dissipation stage. Um, this shows you the thunderstorm cells within an overall thunderstorm. And so, like I said, they last between 20 minutes and an hour, the individual cells. Um, then we looked at how lightning was formed, and we said that lightning was formed by, uh, on the Bergeron process, when the uh, 
particles are coming down, they're glancing off each other, they're actually picking up electrons as they go down. So the bottom of the cloud gets very negatively charged. And everything on the ground is a combination of positive and negative charges, but that the positive charges will actually come up at high points like buildings or horses or people walking across ball fields. And they'll come up there, or trees, and then it will be allow the tree, the tree, <laughs> it will allow the cloud to put out a stepped leader um, coming down and then the positive charges will start to come up to meet it and then the real lightning, the return stroke comes blasting down. And so uh, we saw some different things of lightning um, there. Okay, let's see. Oh, I was explaining convection thunderstorms to you and how they, all summer long, we have convection thunderstorms. I was trying to think, why is that picture there? That's why that picture was there. We went over that last week. And then we talked about tornadoes. And we said that tornadoes also have developmental stages. So just so you can follow along with me, I'm over on page 191. And so when you start to see the... Uh, the little funnel cloud come out of the sky, it's the whirl stage. And then when you see that funnel cloud touch the ground, it's the organizing stage. When it starts to suck up dirt and plants and trees and trucks and people and cows, that's the mature stage. Okay, so it looks very de devastating at that point. Eventually it gets a bellyache from all the trucks and houses that it sucked up and it starts to shrink back into the cloud and that's the shrinking stage. And then when it's no longer visible, that's called the decay stage. So there are these five stages and they're very, very dangerous uh, because tornadoes can get up to 250 mile an hour winds and they can be up to 500 feet across. And so, and I've heard of them actually, that's an average, I've heard of them being a mile across at the bottom. And so those are really, really dangerous. And then we started, oh, that's, what is that? You tell me, that's over water, so what is that? Okay, that's a water spout. And there's two of them here. Well, there's a couple, aren't there? Look at them, okay? So if that was over land, that might turn into a uh, tornado. That's a water spout on Lake Michigan in 2013. And the, that's a YouTube video. You can actually hear the water spout from where the guy is. You can hear it, it's scary. So at least that'd be scary to me. Um, and then that's a dust devil. Dust devils aren't attached to clouds, so they don't have the strength that the tornadoes have. Uh, but they can still knock a person over or a cow or something like that. And I would imagine they could make you so you couldn't breathe because it's full of dust. Yes, sir? I've actually seen a few before. Have you? I was, yeah, I was in the Death Valley area. We were driving through it, and I saw a few dust devils. Cool. Luckily, well, none were very close. That's good. That's good. I've seen little tiny dust devils here in Florida along the side of the road. If you look on a really hot day, but they're like this big, you know, and you'll just see paper and stuff being picked up and thrown around. Yeah, we have little bitty versions of, of dust devils here. What's that? That's a hurricane, right? And I think that's where we left off last week uh, that we were together, isn't it? Yep. Is it the hurricane? And so... Um, what is the technical name for a hurricane? Tropical cyclone. tropical cyclone. And what designates the difference between a tropical storm and a hurricane? The wind speed, very good. And so as they watch the wind speed, they'll say, well, there's a tropical disturbance. And then the wind speed gets greater, and then they go, oh, now it's a tropical storm. And, or a tropical depression, I'm sorry. And then if it gets faster still, it's a tropical storm. And who knows what is the speed of the winds to designate it a hurricane? 74 miles per hour, which is weird. It's kind of random, isn't it? But that's how they designate it. And then they categorize them by Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3 by how high the wind speeds are. And that kind of gives you an idea how much damage it's going to do. If you and I both knew more about meteorology, we would be able to look at the how, how low the pressure is in the eye, and that would give us some idea of how dangerous a storm it is. Because the lower the pressure in the eye, apparently the stronger the storm. Because um, it's like a big... Uh, like a big straw, <laughs> sucking it up when it's got really low pressure. Anyway, um, the reason that these bad boys spin the way they do is because of the Coriolis effect. 
And the two things you need to produce a hurricane usually is a whole bunch of warm water and a very pronounced Coriolis effect. Well, the most pronounced Coriolis effect is going to be around the equator, isn't it? And you got a lot of warm water near the equator too, don't you? So when we're looking for hurricanes, usually we look off the coast of Africa, the west coast of Africa, and they come up what my family lovingly calls the chute. And so, you know, if you see a storm coming up off the uh, west coast of Africa, you might be concerned about that. Here you go. See, so you'd have a pronounced Coriolis effect here. You can see all the storms, right? And um, so when one of these starts to develop and starts to do its spin, and then we know that we could be in trouble because it'll come up here and possibly hit us. Um, let's go back for a minute. Here, let's go back to there. The, what's this part of the storm called? The eye. the eye of the storm. And if you're in the eye of the storm, it might be seven to 10 miles across and it'll look totally clear. You'll see storms all the way around the edges, but where you are will be totally clear because you're looking straight up where there's no clouds. But it's really creepy in the eye of the storm because there'll be no bugs making noises, no birds. All the critters are too smart for that. They stay hidden. Because as South Floridians, we are taught that the hurricane, the most dangerous part of the hurricane is where? The eye. The eye. Well, it's the eye wall, therefore the eye is the most dangerous place in the hurricane because it gives people a false sense of security and they go out in it and then the eye wall slams them and it kills them or hurts them badly. Okay, because that's where the most uh, high powered winds are is right around the eye wall. And so if you were to take this storm and you were to cut it in half and then look at it from the side, you have, here's the eye, so you have storms over here and here, and the, the, these should be big clouds, shouldn't they? There you go. And you have storms over here, but then you have this, this place in here that's the eye, and these, um, these clouds are moving around in a circular motion. And remember, because the Coriolis effect, if you're heading away from the equator, you outrun the Earth, and so it bends this way. And if you're running towards the equator, the Earth outruns you, and so it bends uh, the other way. And that's why it gets this spinning effect. Well, what happens is that when this develops into this organized a storm, it actually gets a very low pressure system under here. And it's literally like a big straw. And so what does a straw do if there's water underneath it? <laughs> It sucks it up into the straw. We've all done this. We've all put water in our straw and put our finger over it and then put it on your brother's napkin or whatever and gotten in trouble. We've all done this, it's, or your sisters, at some point in time. That's what the storm does, is it, it doesn't do the napkin, but it sucks up the water into this area. And then, remember this is like seven to 10 miles across, and then it moves inland. And what do we call that when this part of the storm moves inland? That is the storm surge. And that's why it's so dangerous, is because it's not like this hurricane already has between 74 and maybe uh, 150 mile an hour winds. So it's already got really, really, really big waves. But not only does it have waves, now it has waves and the whole ocean is anywhere from 10 to 40 feet higher and being pulled inland. And so that's why the storm surge is so deadly. And if you're on the this part of the storm, when the storm surge comes in, you've also got all this pushing the water behind it. So it gets to be very, very dangerous. This is a couple real photographs of storm surges, okay? Just to give you a feel, uh, it's not a good thing. This is Hurricane Katrina storm surge, and I don't know about you, but that looks basically like a wall of water. It's the whole ocean that's picked up and being carried inland. It's not just one big wave, the whole ocean. <laughs> is picked up in that straw area and is being carried in. Very, very dangerous. And this is the storm surge from the recent hurricane in uh, Jacksonville Beach, okay? So these can be very, very devastating to wherever the storm surge comes in and hits. Um, the rain bands, once again, feed out from the eye and the eye wall is the, where the most dangerous part of the storm is when the first edition of this book came out, they had a question on the test, and I hadn't read the test before I taught the class, so I went home and I came back the next week with the test, and on the test there was a question, 
where is the safest place in a hurricane? Now, I'm teaching that. That particular class was in Gainesville. And every Floridian knows that the safest place in the hurricane is not the eye. OK? And that's the answer he wanted. Nobody answered the eye, because anybody in Florida knows better. You should have heard the answers I got. Out of state. Uh, just all sorts of interesting answers about where was the safest place in a hurricane, OK? Um, and actually, in the next edition, they changed the question because they had so much response on it. But I remember when I was teaching at the Christian school, I had a student come down from Maryland, and she goes, they still teach us that the safest place in a hurricane is the eye. And all of us are looking at her, shaking our heads, going, no, that's not right. <laughs> so, because down here we've had so many people get hurt in the eye because they go outside, like I said, false sense of security, think it's safe, and then whap, they get slammed by the uh, rain bands in the eye wall and get hurt very badly. Anyway, so the safest place in a hurricane, hmm, if you don't live close to the ocean, it would probably be in your house and everything's correctly secured, right? With your hurricane awnings up, your shutters and all that. Um, in 1991, Hurricane Andrew was a Cat 4. Charlie in 2004 was a Cat 4. And Katrina that was most recent was a Cat 5. And some of you might have even gone up there to help with the cleanup after Katrina. I don't know if any of you did, but a lot of people went up there to try to help. Um, I think Wilma was the same year as Charlie. And so that was in 2004. And I don't know if you remember that, but Wilma, she did a job on Boca Raton. And I remember, and you guys over here got hit that year like with two or three, just bang, three. OK, bang, bang, bang. And I remember one of the directors here said that one side of her house looked like somebody had sandblasted the uh, paint off of it. It literally, the storm took the paint off the side of her house because there were three storms um, that year. And I remember that year. The reason I remember, because I was working over here, the reason I remember is because they, the street lights were down for three weeks. I would have to get from the interstate to here with no street lights on Glades Roads for three weeks. The trees were all down. I remember the students that year, really funny because the students said, I never knew so many kids lived in my neighborhood. Because all of a sudden there was no power for extended periods of time, so everybody was outside. And they never saw them because normally they were inside watching TV or playing on their computers or whatever. And the other thing I remember the students told me was they didn't know there were that many kids in their neighborhood and they'd never seen so many stars. You take away the light pollution, and you will see so many stars, and it is so cool. How many of you have ever been someplace where there's not a lot of light, and you see all sorts of stars? Isn't it cool? I've been in the middle of the ocean and done that. Oh, it's cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really, really is. You too? Yeah, the ocean is real good for that. I have a farm in the middle of nowhere, and there's like, it's like over 40 acres, so we can literally just sit on chairs in front of our little trailer home and look out in there. It is. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And so that was the two things the, the young people saw. Lots of people in their neighborhood they didn't know. Lots of stars. Clay? Um, um, well, Colin and I, we do a scout. We do scout and boy scouts. Yeah. Um, most campsites are mostly uh, the, out of the way of the big cities. So sure. You can, so you, most of the time you can get a good view of the stars. Cool. Very cool. The, and then it's neat when you can see them all. Yes, sir. So, I've been to this place called Bryce Canyon, Colorado, and that's probably yeah. the best place to see stars in the world. I've heard that it's before. Really cool. Yeah, isn't it? There's pictures. You can go on the internet and actually search stars from Bryce Canyon, and you, it's amazing. It really is. It's cool because you got lower light pollution. So anyway, OK. And so that's one of the benefits of a hurricane. Do you want to know another as a Floridian? Because this, this just really doesn't tell you the benefits of a hurricane. Benefits of a hurricane or a tropical storm as a Floridian, two things. Number one, in the natural environment, like in the forests and stuff in Florida, so they're called hammocks, tropical hammocks and things like that. It actually wipes out a lot of the old tree growth and any of the weaker trees. It takes them out and clears them out. And then the other thing that my husband has pointed out to me is that actually the aquifer gets too low. When we do not have tropical storms or hurricanes for years and years and years, and I don't know if you've noticed this, they come in waves. Okay, So there'll be a couple years where we'll get a bunch of hurricanes, a bunch of storms, and then there'll be years and years and years in between where we don't get anything, which has been the case up until this year. We, we 
haven't had anything for years. Um, and so what happens is the aquifer, which is the water level under the state of Florida, gets low. And so the storms actually bring the water levels back up in the aquifer, which is very, very important. So they're really important part of our uh, cycle here in Florida to keep the water levels like they need to be for everything. Okay, uh, so on page 194, it actually says here that uh, right before the On Your Own questions, it says that the largest storm surge ever recorded was by a hurricane in 1899 with a 43-foot high storm surge. That's like a four and a half story building falling on you and it's the whole ocean. That wouldn't be good. And then it says Katrina had a 30 foot storm surge and they thought their little levy was gonna take care of that. I don't think so. Anyway, forgive me. Okay, they told them to get out. Uh, 8.6, um, on your own. The early warning stage of a tornado is called a funnel cloud. This is a cone-shaped extension of a cloud that is pointed toward the ground. When a small funnel cloud that is still high off the ground is spotted, what stage is the uh, tornado in? The whirl stage. The whirl stage, thank you. 8.7, suppose you are unfortunate enough to be caught in a hurricane. The winds are blowing, the rain is coming down, and water is everywhere. Suddenly, it is sunny and calm. Is the hurricane over? No. no, no, the hurricane is not over. So stay inside or go out carefully and come right back in. Right? Okay. Um, weather maps and weather prediction. Okay, predicting weather is difficult. And if you finished your lab, you know what I'm talking about. If you're actually, unless, of course, you just said it was hot, it was hot, it was hot. <laughs> and then you were cheating. Um, but if you were actually to try to predict the weather, it gets a lot harder. And maybe you've had some event that you were hoping for good weather on, and when you watched the weather and they made a prediction and it didn't work out that way, you got a little mad because it wasn't exactly what they said. It's hard to predict the weather because you can't, well, you've seen this with hurricanes when they start changing directions. And, and you go, wait a second, it was going this way and now it's going that way. Uh, that was what Andrew did. Hurricane Andrew, what was that, 91 that it said? Hurricane Andrew was not supposed to hit Miami. It was not supposed to hit Miami. And my parents went from their house in Miami to Naples and we were over there at the time. And my husband saw that the, cha the uh, storm changed course and he called my parents and he goes, you better get back to Miami, you better get home. Storm's gonna hit Miami. My dad, nah, it's not gonna hit. You know, it's going another direction. He goes, check, check the TV. He goes back on the TV, my parents called back, okay, we're leaving. And they had to run back to Miami and hunker down everything because that storm just all of a sudden changed course. Do you remember that? And just plowed through Miami and ripped it to pieces. It looked like there was a nuclear bomb that went through um, South Miami and Homestead. I remember, I remember going down a year later and the buildings were still torn up. It was really, really bad. And Hurricane Andrew was the first hurricane that they realized that hurricanes are full of tornadoes. Before then, they didn't know that. And after Hurricane Andrew, they realized that hurricanes are full of tornadoes because during Hurricane Andrew in South Miami, one house would be totally destroyed and the next three houses would be fine and then the next house would be totally destroyed. Well, that's what a tornado does. That's not what hurricanes do. And so that was when they figured out that hurricanes are, and that makes sense. What kind of cloud do you see tornadoes attached to? Cumulonimbus. What kind of clouds are in a hurricane? Cumulonimbus, right? And so it's actually pretty logical, but that's why Andrew was so devastating is because it just, it surprised everybody because it changed directions and then it was full of, t of tornadoes. So prediction can be very difficult because you're trying to calculate things. Look at all the different things that it says have to be taken into consideration. You have to consider the temperature, the atmospheric pressure, the wind direction, the speed, the humidity, the amount of precipitation, the cloud cover, cloud type, conditions in the upper atmosphere. I'm gonna tell you another one, when Wilma hit, when Wilma hit, she came in on the west coast, came across the state of Florida to hit the east coast. That's odd all by itself, right? Usually they come in from the ocean, mm, not Wilma. Wilma comes in from the west coast, hits it, and comes all the way across the east coast. Well, everybody expected Wilma to lose power going across the, the state because they gain their power from the ocean, right? It's a big hot water pump. 
Wilma gained power going across the state. And I remember they explained it at the time. It had to do with upper atmosphere and it was sucking stuff up from somewhere or something. All we knew as Floridians is this storm comes in and it's stronger by the time it gets to the East Coast coming across the state. It went right across Alligator Alley like a car. And it got stronger. Remember that? Freaked everybody out. That year we had we got hit on our coast. I think we had four storms. And I remember one of them came in, and when the storm was coming in, it's a Cat 1. Fine. We put everything in the garage. We tie everything else to the, the front of the garage. It's a Cat 1. I leave my horse outside. By the time the storm came in at 11 o'clock that night, it was between a Cat 2 and a Cat 3. I can't get my horse in now. Not only is it dark and in the middle of a storm, but we filled the garage with all sorts of other stuff, so I had no place to put him. So all night long, I'm praying like crazy. I guess that was, that was 14 years ago, whatever storm that was. I was praying like crazy for my horse because he's out there in the storm. And then God really got my attention. I felt our brand new, the wall of our brand new house shudder. And I went, oh, maybe I should be praying for us too. I'm just praying for my horse. So as soon as the morning came and the winds came down at all and it got light, you know where I was. I was outside looking to see if my horse was still somewhere on the property. And he was. But I felt so badly because he was so tired from holding himself against that wind. And my horse was very strong. He was a stallion. And he was so tired, he was literally shaking all over. His head was down and he was, his whole body was trembling because that poor baby had to stand out there in that bad wind all night. I was like, that's never happening again. You're going in the garage. Everything else can fly away. <laughs> you know? And actually, the next door we had, we put the horses in the garage. I just threw hay out there. It was so fun because you could come out the door and there's the horses right in the garage. It was great. My husband didn't like it, but I thought, it was great. I thought we should be like that all the time. Anyway, <laughs> so I know I'm sick and twisted. Um, all right, so then it tells us that one of the ways we can follow the weather or find out what's going on is through radar. And you guys know that. Um, this is weather prediction. This is the idea of trying to figure out what's going on and trying to predict where it's coming from. When you see these situations, that's radar. And there's, that's Doppler radar. I know there's a big one if you go just, to, I pass it every time I leave here because it's right off of the uh, Turnpike Extension just on the right hand side as you're getting into Fort Lauderdale, right before 595 if you know where I'm talking about. There's one of these, okay? So that's Doppler radar. Now remember, regular radar just tells you where it is. Doppler radar tells you how fast it's coming at you or leaving you. And that's the whole difference is the Doppler gives you that extra little information. It's actually what the troopers use when they tell you you're going to have a ticket because you were going so and so miles an hour. So the Doppler radar actually tells you the speed of the storm. And let's be honest, just knowing where the storm is really isn't enough if the storm is barreling at you at 10 miles an hour. Do you see what I'm saying? So just knowing where it is isn't enough. Does anybody know how they used to tell where the storms were and how they were coming before they had radar or before they had Doppler radar? Anybody want to make a guess? Yes, sir. Like storm planes? There were storm planes, but even before then, and you are absolutely right, sir, there were, there were storm planes before then. They had ships. As the ships would get caught in them, think about that. As the ships would get caught in them, they would come into port and say, we just hit a hurricane, and it's so-and-so. Well, now think about it. If you don't have Doppler radar, you can't tell how fast it's coming. You can't tell if it's going to hit you at all. Have you ever been through Belle Glade, Florida? Have you guys ever driven through Belle Glade, Florida? You go through Belle Glade, Florida, which is right below Lake Okeechobee, going across the coast, and there's this statue of this family like this, and they're in a storm. It's because in the 1920s, before they had radar, there was a hurricane, there were actually two hurricanes that came through in the late 1920s, and thousands of people died, drowned out there, because it picked up Lake Okeechobee and made a storm surge out of Lake Okeechobee, and it drowned those people. And they, they had very makeshift homes in a lot of cases and all, and there weren't even that many people out there, but there were thousands of people that they buried after that storm. And that's why they have that uh, statue there. If you ever drive through Belle Glade, look for the statue, you'll see it. And it's there because so many people died. So radar has been, and, and think about it, guys. Have you guys experienced a hurricane since you're old enough to remember? Do you remember what the day before the hurricane looked like? It was beautiful. It was a beach day. Woohoo! You know, it looks like a day you want to go to the beach. So if you didn't know the storm was coming, you could very easily get caught. 
Okay, we're so blessed to have the radar and the Doppler radar so that we can know that it's coming and can get ready for it. This is why I don't, like those poor people in California with the earthquakes, they don't have any uh, warning. And the poor people that live in Tornado Alley out in the western United States, there's no warning. At least with hurricanes, sure, they're big and they're nasty. <laughs> but I know days before to get ready. <laughs> you know? So if I don't get ready, shame on me. Right? Anyway. Okay. Um, so they have radar, Doppler radar, and then the way we get a lot of the information we have today is we use, that's how the radar works and it bounces off the storm, um, is we use satellites, don't we? We use weather satellites and that's how we get the cool pictures from outer space and we can tell what's going on beneath it. And so that is actually the one that's mentioned in your book, the first one that went up in um, 1959. And that's a current weather satellite. And so the weather satellites are able to give us a big picture of what's going on underneath us. And on page 195, uh, figure 8.9, it shows you the global temperatures measured by a satellite. And this shows you that the, uh, what that is is the, the, the line going across the middle is what they consider average temperatures. And so the, the temperatures below it say when things were cooler than they expected they should be. And the temperature above say when they're hotter than they, what they expect it to be. Personally, I want to know where they got the baseline. And he didn't really say that that I saw. But anyway, um, so turn over to page 196, please. Because this is the one you're going to have to know how to do. OK. These are called isobars. Iso means same. You're going to learn that again in biology and in chemistry. <sighs> Iso means equals or the same. And bars is referring to barometric pressure. It's talking about pressure. So isobars are areas that have the same pressure. Here is a high pressure system. Everything in this circle, which is an isobar, has the same high pressure. Once you go across that isobar, then the pressure decreases. How do I know that? Because this is a high pressure system. If you go to a low pressure system, anything in that isobar has the same low pressure. As I move out across an isobar, then the pressure gets higher. And I go out of, across another one, the pressure gets higher again. Okay, so you have to look at what's in the middle, and then as you work out, if it's a high pressure system, every isobar you cross, the pressure is getting lower. If it's a low pressure system, every isobar you cross, it's getting higher. So far, so good. And anything within that isobar has the same barometric pressure. That's what those are for. Then on your map on, on, in the book, it's color coordinated, but in your test, it's not going to be. It's going to be black and white, so let's do this black and white. If uh, the line has spikes on one side. What kind of front is that? Cold front. Because remember, cold fronts come in with a bang. Cumulonimbus clouds. <laughs> right? So they come in with thunder and lightning. and <laughs> So they get spikes on their side. What about a warm front? How does a warm front come in? They call me mellow yellow, right? That comes in with the long light rain and all that. So what do they put on it? They put little balls, you know, like Q-tips on the side because they're going to come in mellow. So that's a warm front, okay? And then this map doesn't actually show all the differences. Here you go. You have one that looks very confused. It's got spikes on one side and little balls on the other side, cotton balls on the other side. What kind of front is that, besides being very confused? What kind of front is that? Got them on opposite sides. Is that front moving in either direction? Because remember, they move in the direction of, what is it? Oh, actually, you're close. That's a stationary front. Let me show you the difference. I'm glad you said that, OK? Um, if the front has spikes on one side and cotton balls on the other side, this side is cold, this side is warm, and that's stationary because they have them on both sides. So they're pulling in opposite directions. So that's a stationary front. It's stalled. If, though, you see the cotton balls and the spikes on one side, that's occluded because it's moving in the same direction. OK, so you got the cold, warm, cold, and it's uh, the cold trying to outrun the others. OK, good. I'm glad you brought that up because that's very good. OK, so warm front's got the little ball on it. Cold front's got the little spikes on it. Both sides would be stationary or a stalled front. And then all on one side, like on your book, on the um, the bottom left, that's an occluded front there. And then at the top of the map, there you have a stationary front in both directions. 
Now remember, you have to be able to apply what kind of rain you would expect to see. So in front of a cold front, you would expect to see thunderstorms. In front of a warm front, you would expect to have long light rain. Okay, uh, A high pressure system is a cold area because the um, yeah, because the cold air is heavy, so it sinks and it presses on the ground underneath it, so it produces high pressure. A low pressure system is warm because hot air rises, and so you have less air pressing on the ground underneath it. Does that make sense? All right, so on page 197, on your own, 8.8, .8, ground-based temperature measurements tend to be made near places where people live, whereas satellite temperature measurements cover essentially the whole Earth. Would you expect the average temperature of the Earth as calculated by ground-based measurements to be higher than or lower than the calculated, that calculated by satellite measurements? What would you expect? Higher, very good. Um, and as time moves on, well, that's because people tend to live where it's warmer, right? <laughs> as time moves on and cities get larger, would you expect the difference between the satellite measurements and ground-based measurements to be the same or to increase? Increase, good, good. Okay, and then turn on page 198. We have based on figure 8.9, would you expect to experience higher or lower atmospheric pressure if you left San Francisco and started heading east? So let's look at San Francisco, and then we're starting to head east. What's happening to the atmospheric pressure? It's getting lower and lower, isn't it? Because you're heading towards the low pressure system. And then if you look at it and it says, uh, find the occluded front, Will it be, in the next few days, will it be in Mexico or will it be in Denver? Good, the occluded front will be in Mexico in the next few days, very good. Okay, let's do the Ice Age, ever so briefly. Okay. That was isotherms. He mentioned in the chapter that if you did those bars by the same temperature, they're called isotherms because they're put together by temperature. And so that's a picture of isotherms where the temperatures are the same. Remember, the flood was caused by God, but when God judged the world with the flood and he opened the fountains of the deep, possibly by using comets or whatever he chose to, the one large continent broke into several continents. It, they were thrown apart. And you have the Earth's oceans in direct contact. Let's just go there. You have the Earth's oceans in direct contact with the mantle of the Earth. When that happens, the Earth's oceans get warm. Also, when you rip the continents apart, you have a lot of volcanic activity. That throws ash and aerosols in the air. The air gets cold. So the flood set up a situation where you have warm oceans and cool air. And when you have that, that sets up an ice age. I want you to understand, have any of you ever seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow? It's an old movie now, but The Day After Tomorrow, and they set up an ice age scenario. What did they use? They used a warm ocean current in a cold part of the world. They know that's what's required for an ice age. This is, the evolutionists can't explain why there was ever one ice age. They think there were multiple ice ages, though, because of the way they misread the rocks, because they read the rocks as being millions and millions of years, whereas if you read it as the flood and then ice age layers on the top of it, then it makes a lot more sense. So the warm water and the cold air produced a lot of evaporation and precipitation, which you've learned about. Warm water evaporates in the air and then it condenses and precipitates. During this time, right after the flood, the oceans were warm and so there was a lot of rain in here, but inland away from the equator, so in the upper latitudes, it was quite cold. So instead of raining up in these areas, it snowed and it snowed and it snowed. And the ice age was a time where 33% of the planet was covered by ice rather than today smaller amount. The ice was in different places than where it is today because today Antarctica and the North Pole are where you find the most um, glaciers and things like that. But during the Ice Age, the ice was inland in the upper latitude. So if you went to like St. Louis, it would have looked like the North Pole. <laughs> or if you went to North Germany, it would have looked like the North Pole. So it was different then. It was in different places. And so the Arctic Ocean was actually ice free right after the flood. So that pumped a lot of water into the Earth's atmosphere and that would have provided a lot of uh, moisture for the precipitation. The storms during the Ice Age were not like today's uh, hurricanes, which average between 75 and 150 miles an hour and they're active for days and they're about state size, maybe a couple hundred miles across. The storms during the Ice Age were called hypercanes by scientists today and they were like 
the size of continents, and they were 500 mile an hour winds, and they lasted for weeks. And immediately, being the person I am, I said, how do you know this? How do you know these storms existed? Well, when you look at the, the deposits that are laid down after a hurricane today, they're usually a couple inches of deposits carried by the hurricane and laid down. And what we see here in Florida is that some of these storms laid down like eight and nine feet of deposits. And, and, and it hits me that maybe what the evolutionists are interpreting as an ice age, and they'll say there were you know, 20 or 30 ice ages, maybe what they're actually seeing is the deposits from these hypercanes during the one ice age, you know, because they would have laid down so much. Anyway, um, okay, so during the ice age, I told you that here there was a lot of rain and up here there was a lot of snow. And evidence for that would be that they find water erosion in the Sahara Desert. What is now the Sahara Desert shows a lot of evidence of previous water erosion, even on the Great Sphinx. Um, at the end of the ice age, excuse me, at the end of the flood, that was what started the Ice Age. This whole area was actually underwater in here. This central portion of the United States and Florida was non-existent at that time. It was underwater because sea level was 300 feet higher than what it is today at the end of the flood, which means there were a couple little bumps that we would call islands way up in North Florida, <laughs> okay? But that would be it. So the rest of it would be underwater, and this part would all be underwater because all there were no glaciers at the beginning of the Ice Age, at the end of the flood, there would be no glaciers yet. So all the water from every piece of ice that exists today would be in the Earth's oceans. That's why sea level was 300 feet higher than what it is today. As the ice age progressed, and a lot of the water is being taken out of the oceans and put on the land as ice cubes that we call glaciers, it made sea level drop. Because today we have this big, huge ice cube sitting in the Arctic Ocean so it's bringing the water levels back up. It's kind of like, think about a glass of ice water, if, and it's a full glass of ice water. If you take the ice cubes out and put them in a, on a dish, the water level's gonna go down, isn't it? And then if you take a few ice cubes and put them back, the water level comes back up. Well, at the end of the flood, all the water was in the Earth's oceans. At the peak of the ice age, you took all the ice cubes out of the glass and the level goes way down. Now we have a big ice cube floating in the Arctic Ocean, so it's like putting a few of the ice cubes back and the water level comes back up. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's why we have this 600 foot difference in sea levels from when they first got off the ark to when the water levels were the lowest, when the, the glaciers were at their highest. And that's when Florida was actually really quite huge. At that time, because sea level was down over 300 feet lower than what it is today, literally from the mountains of Ararat, they could walk into Australia and walk down into, uh, let's see, they could walk down into Antarctica, I'm pretty sure through here, they could walk through the Bering Straits and down into the Americas. This is probably the land bridge they took into Antarctica. But I know they could walk down into Australia and in all these areas. So they could literally walk across these bridges. And there are ancient maps that actually show these as land. Um, so did I say bridges? There are ancient maps that actually show these, these land bridges and stuff when they were exposed. So they were obviously and then how do secular scientists handle that is they say spacemen told it to ancient man. No, I don't think so. I think they just probably mapped it during the Ice Age when it was, you know, able to be seen. So that's just my thought. This just shows you some of the different uh, coasts in Florida uh, because of the different uh, sea levels in Florida. And so notice on this coast, this is why people come here from all over the world to go deep sea fishing, because you can come here and go very small distance and it drops off and it's really deep. But notice on the Naples side, you can go way out before it gets deep and therefore Florida was huge. And they actually, on this side, they actually find uh, remnants of swamps under the water now. They find Indian villages, remnants of Indian villages under the water on that side. So there's a lot of supporting evidence for that. Um, okay, and during that time, that's when everything migrated out from the mountains of Ararat, which I mentioned to you before. 
when at the end of the ice age that these glaciers started to melt, uh, they actually caused a lot of erosion because these, the, these ice dams, actually as the water's melting, it backs up behind it and it's got some strange name and I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, it, it's a hard name because it's like Norwegian or something. But as these, uh, the water starts to melt in these glaciers behind it and there's an ice dam and then when the ice dam breaks, it just makes this huge erosion area. And even the evolutionary scientists will tell you that in the last ice age, which they put at 18,000 years ago, that the glaciers, as they melted, actually formed the uh, Scablands, the channeled Scablands, and Lake Missoula. That is one of the places where they believe that this uh, water from the glacier ripped out this area, ripped out this area. Uh, you notice there are different areas. But the point is that um, it causes a lot of, of <laughs> erosional basins and Grand Canyon during the Ice Age it's believed that Grand Canyon upwarps on the eastern side and uh, it's believed that there was a lake that had backed up there um, during the Ice Age and when that lake finally was able to rip through there that's what we believe ripped out Grand Canyon and just literally carried it all away. Now let's be honest if the Colorado River cut out that Grand that Canyon over a long slow period of time like we're told by the evolutionists, then there should be a delta at the end of the river, yet there is no delta at the end of the Colorado River. But if it got ripped out of there very fast and carried away, that would explain this better. Also, if the Colorado River cut out that hole, it would have had to run a mile uphill. Well, water doesn't like running uphill. So it, it's just actually better science that it was cut out this way. And a lot of people are starting to lean on that. They just don't all agree on when. Um, during the Ice Age, if you were near the water, it was warm because the oceans were warm. But if you were, um, so even up here, if you were near the water, it was warm. But if you were inland in the upper latitudes, it was really, really cold. Or down here, if you were inland, it was really, really cold. And so animals that, well, what, what, what continent would you say these animals lived on today? If you saw this picture today, what continent would these animals live on? Africa. It's got hyenas and elephants and stuff. Africa. This is a picture of what lived in uh, Great Britain during the Ice Age. How could these animals live in Great Britain during the Ice Age? Because it's surrounded by water, isn't it? And so it was warmer during the Ice Age. We had elephants here. We had mammoths and mastodons here in Florida during the Ice Age. And so um, very different environment. And the mammoths were able to survive very nicely along the north coast of Alaska and Siberia because if you're near the water it was warm but if you're inland it was cold and so they tell us that there's like a never-ending supply of ivory off of the coast of Siberia in the ocean because of all the uh, mammoths that went and died there and yet nobody can explain how there was enough grass there to feed all those mammoths well because during the ice age it was warm near the water so that would have explained how the vegetation vegetation could have lived there. And then at the end of the Ice Age, when it ended, these mammoths probably headed for the water because the weather was changing very quickly and Mama Mammoth knew that as long as she went to the beach it was safe because it had always been warm before. And so when she got there this time, it wasn't safe anymore because the Ice Age had ended and it started to get cold up there. And so if you see where these red spots were, those are where they find frozen mammoths. And you see the yellow spots, that's where they find frozen woolly rhinos. And um, if you'll notice, they all seem to be headed for the water or already on the water, don't they? And these are not flood strata that they're finding them in. They're ice age strata. They're above the flood strata. So this would explain why we see some of the things we see due to the Ice Age. At the end of the Ice Age, a lot of animals that had made it up until then didn't make it anymore because the fast weather pattern changes that shifted. See, once the Earth's oceans cooled, it didn't take long for the, the air to warm up because the volcanic activity subsided and so the ash kind of fell out and the air started to warm up. But the oceans would have taken longer, about 700 to 1,000 years to cool off. Once the Earth's oceans cooled, then the weather patterns would have shifted pretty rapidly. Think about how involved the ocean is in our hurricanes and other weather patterns, right? So once those Earth's oceans cool, it's just like I, one of the moms said to me today, well, it was a lot warmer over here than it was on your coast. Well, you guys have the Gulf Stream right off of this coast. It keeps 
you warmer than the other coast. It really does. So the water in the ocean really makes a difference. And when the Earth's oceans finally cooled, then the ice age ended. And it shifted pretty rapidly. And a biblical, possible biblical mark for that is Joseph being in Pharaoh's court when there were seven years of feast and seven years of famine. He was 700 years after the flood. So that could have actually been the mark when the ice age ended and the weather pattern shifted. And that's why they had such a, a famine situation afterwards. Just a guess. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get ready for your test. So flip over to the study guide and let's do that. So you guys tell me, what's an updraft? Good, current of rising air, I like it. What's an insulator? Okay, something that doesn't conduct electricity very well. Very good. Number two, both the Bergeron process and the collision coalescence process explain precipitation, but they each begin with a different kind of cloud. And here what they're asking for is which one's a warm cloud or a cold cloud. So which kind of cloud does the Bergeron process start with? Cold, cold cloud. And what kind of cloud would you think of as a cold cloud? Cumulus cloud, okay, because it's a tall cloud. And then what about the collision coalescence process? Warm. warm cloud. And what kind of cloud can you think of that's a warm cloud? Stratus, very good. Okay, number three, which of the two theories of precipitation governs the fall of rain from the top of a cumulonimbus cloud? Bergeron process. Bergeron process, good. Is that what you said? Yeah. Good, thank you. And what kind of rain cloud would be most likely described by the collision coalescence process? Nimbostratus. Very good, nimbostratus, thank you. Number four, what is the difference between drizzle and rain? The size of the rain. Very good, the size. Number five, what's the difference between sleet, hail, and freezing rain? So first off, give me sleet. What's it look like? Little good, little pellets of ice. What about hail? Like rocks of ice, right? Okay, and what about freezing rain? Right, so it just looks like an ice storm, doesn't it? Very good. Um, Let's see, number six, a meteorologist measures the dew point on two different mornings. The first morning is very humid and the atmospheric pressure is high. The second morning is not nearly as humid and the atmospheric pressure has fallen. On which day will the dew point be the coldest? The second day, because remember, the higher the humidity and pressure, the higher the dew point. So the lower the humidity and pressure, the lower the dew point, okay? Uh, let's see. And I think he's going to ask you what the dew point is. Remember, it's the temperature that the dew forms. Um, okay, let's see. Name the three stages of a thunderstorm cell in order they occur. So what's the first stage? Cumulus. Cumulus. What's the second stage? Mature. Mature. What's the third stage? Dissipation. Dissipation. Uh, at each stage, indicate whether you have updraft, drowned draft, or both. Okay, so in the cumulus stage, which do you have? Updraft. Okay, in the mature stage? Both, up and down. And in the dissipation stage? Down, down strictly down. Thank you. Um, let's see. Is that all we were supposed to do? Oh, precipitation. When will you have precipitation? Will you have precipitation in the cumulus stage? No. 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 What about the other two? Yeah. yeah, as long as you have a downdraft, you could have precipitation. Number eight, if a heavy rain of a thunderstorm lasts more than 30 minutes, what can you conclude about the makeup? More than one cell. So I guess I said this earlier, I probably said it wrong. Each cell is supposed to last about 20 minutes. Okay. So if it goes longer than that, then it's made up of more than one cell. Number nine, lightning forms as a result of electrical charge imbalance. Where does the charge imbalance originate and why does it occur? So remember, it originates from the particles coming down through the cloud and bumping into other particles and picking up the electrons. And so that sets up that electrical difference. Excuse me, I'm gonna grab my glasses so I can actually see. It's tough getting old. Anyway, um, let's see. And I have a note here to ask you, could we see lightning from a narrow cloud like a stratus cloud? Think about it. No. No, because remember, it's, it doesn't have the height it needs for the thing to go bouncing down and glancing off each other and picking up the charge. So a stratus cloud is really too thin, isn't it? You need a tall cloud to get that electrical charge difference going. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Uh, number 10, which is responsible for most of the light and sound in a lightning bolt, the step leader or the return stroke? Sure. Definitely return stroke. Number 11, where does the thunder in a thunderstorm come from? Intensity. Good. Superheated air. Very good. So intense heat. Number 12, why do lightning bolts tend to strike targets that are high? That's where the charge is built up. Very good. The positive charge is able to build up there. Number 13, what is the difference between sheet lightning and a uh, uh, lightning bolt? So where does a sheet lightning go f from one place to the other? Where does it go? Cloud to cloud. Cloud to cloud. Very good. And what about a regular lightning bolt? Cloud to ground. Cloud to ground. Very good. 14, you guys have seen sheet lightning, where the, it goes from one cloud to another. Looks like the whole sky is... Like a light show. It is, it looks like a light show. I was just about to say that, Clay, thank you. 14, what kind of cloud is necessary for tornado formation? Cumulonimbus. Cumulonimbus. What kind of cloud is necessary for a hurricane? Cumulonimbus. Cumulonimbus. What kind of cloud is necessary for a thunderstorm? Cumulonimbus, okay, it's the bad boy on the block. Uh, let's see. Then we have number 15, list the five stages of the tornado in order. Um, so what's the first stage? Whirl. Whirl. Second stage? Organizing. Third stage? Sure. Fourth stage? Sure. Fifth stage? Okay. Good. And uh, which one's most destructive? Sure. Very good. You need to know those. 16, what are the four classifications that lead to a hurricane? You don't have to know this for your test. But that would be your tropical disturbance, tropical depression, tropical storm, and then tropical, tropical cyclone. Um, and, but this you do need to know. What dis designates which one it is? Wind speed. Very good. 17, what are the conditions in the eye of the hurricane? Yeah, deceptively. Okay. <laughs> Number 18, what causes a hurricane in the southern hemisphere to rotate in a different direction than the hurricane in the northern hemisphere? Coriolis effect, very good. Number 19, is the atmospheric pressure in Houston higher, lower, or nearly equivalent to that of Chicago? Good, because what you gotta do is look at Houston, find it, then look at Chicago, then you go to the low and you count up to Chicago and you go across one, two, three lines. Now you go down to Houston from the L and you cross one, two, three lines. So that's why you know they're nearly equivalent. Okay, and number 20, if the atmospheric pressure in Houston is higher, lower, or equivalent to that of Atlanta. So here you start from the low again. And you go to Houston, you gotta go across one, two, three lines. To get to Atlanta, you go across one, two, three, four lines. So is Houston gonna be, let's see, is the atmospheric pressure in Houston lower or higher or equivalent to that of Atlanta? Lower, very good. 21, is the occluded front nearer to San Francisco or Canada? No, remember that one in Canada, it's got spikes on either side, that's the stationary front. The occluded front's the one near the California there, okay? And then number 22, will Atlanta or Indianapolis be in for some warmer weather? Indianapolis. Indianapolis has the warm front coming towards it with the cotton balls on one side. Uh, 23, at the time this map was drawn, what city uh, drawn on the map might be experiencing thunderstorms? I think Houston has a problem. Yes, Houston, very good, because you see that the, uh, the cold front has just passed Houston, so that's why it's got this issue. Um, what city probably experienced long rains followed by thunderstorms recently? San Francisco. San Francisco, because that's got that occluded front, so that's why it would have both. All right, guys, uh, take your test, and then read the first half of the next chapter. Have a Jesus-filled week. <laughs>